Okay, so let's move on to talk about uh, another topic of information theory, mutual information. And once we uh, define this, um, it'll lead us into the third uh, topic for this lecture, which is connecting everything with communication and complexity. Uh, okay, so let's say X and Y now are random variables, but they're not necessarily independent. They're possibly dependent. And so now let's say I ask you, okay, write me a computer program that, you know, uses random bits and it, it's supposed to generate draws from this joint random variable X and Y taken together. Well, then, you know, the number of random bits needed to generate this pair is sort of ideally, or in the amortized long run, uh, entropy of X, Y. As we saw, the last thing we talked about was that if X and Y are independent, then this is just H of X plus H of Y. There's no way you can sort of get savings. I mean, they're independent, so you basically have to spend your bits to generate X and spend bits to generate Y, and that's all you can do. But if they're not independent random variables, you may possibly be able to get savings beyond this H of X plus H of Y. And the savings that you can get, or sort of the most savings you can get, is exactly this quantity called the mutual information between X and Y. So this is again a number. It's denoted I of X and Y with, for some reason, a semicolon instead of a comma between X and Y. It's a number associated with a pair of random variables, X and Y, which um, you imagine are definitely not necessarily independent. Again, what is it? It's H of X plus H of Y which is like how many bits you would have to, a computer program would have to spend to generate a pair, uh, the pair X, Y, if X and Y were independent, um, minus the actual like optimal number of bits you need to generate X and Y together. So it's sort of the savings you get by the fact that X and Y are dependent. So let me, uh, I mean, it's best to really not focus too much on these formulas involving logarithms, which is uh, sort of uh, suggested before. But anyway, if you write down the formula, you see that it's got this expression, um, you know, the sum over all possible outcomes, little x and little y, the probability of little x, little y. This piece gives you, that eventually leads to the h of x term. This piece leads to the h of y term. And this piece, which is subtracted, leads to this term. And then by properties of logarithms, you can turn it into this expression here. And the main reason for writing this down is like this expression you can use to formally prove that the mutual information is non-negative. Okay, so if you think about it, you know, it's kind of clear that it should be non-negative because, you know, it's supposed to represent a savings, which is like a non-negative quantity. Okay, so let me give an example. So here I have uh, the complete sort of not truth table, but like probability table for two random variables, X and Y, which are not independent. And X can take on the values heart, zero, or one. Y can take on the values heart, A, B, C, or D. And it's like this, you know, it's probably a half. They're both heart with probably one over 16. X is zero and Y is A and so forth. Okay, these numbers add up to one. Okay, so let's uh, compute everything just to get like a a feel for these numbers and quantities. So let's first think about like the entropy of X. Like just imagine like uh, you did a draw from these things, but like threw the outcome of Y in the garbage and only thought about like the, the random variable X. So then basically you would see this situation here. The random variable X is heart with probability a half and it's zero with probability a quarter and it's one with probability a quarter. Okay, so you have a random variable that's probabilities are like a half quarter quarter. So its entropy is like a half times one plus a quarter times two, that's the log base two of reciprocal of a quarter, plus another quarter times two. So that all comes out to one and a half. Okay, so H, uh, X has like sort of one and a half bits of information. Or if you only had to generate X, it would take you uh, one and a half bits on average. Uh, right, because actually it's quite easy. You flip a coin, if it comes up heads, you'd be like, X is heart. Otherwise, you flip one more coin to decide if head X should be zero or one. So half the time you're flipping one coin, half the time you're flipping two coins. So on average, you flip one and a half coins. Uh, conversely, if you look at this random variable Y uh, and just ignore X, you know, it's heart with probability a half and it's A with probability one eighth because these are the two outcomes where it's uh, A. 
And in fact, it's A, B, C, and D all with probability one eighth. So its entropy is, you know, this simple calculation, it's two. Okay, so if you just needed to generate Y, it would take you uh, two coin flips on average. Okay, and so therefore the sum of the uh, entropies is three and a half. But if I said, you know, write me a computer program that generated X and Y together according to this distribution, then try to minimize the number of random bits you need, um, you could do it with less than three and a half. So in fact, right, it's just like sort of the entropy formula applied to this column. Sorry for the terrible circling, but a random variable that's probabilities are half, 16, 16, 16, 16, 16. So it's like half times one plus eight copies of a 16th times four, which is two and a half. Okay, and therefore, finally, the total infer, the, sorry, the mutual information is three and a half minus two and a half, which is one. Okay, and let's check that this makes sense. This is supposed to represent like the number of shared bits uh, or sort of the number of like, you know, the amount of savings you can get by virtue of the fact that you're generating X and Y together as opposed to like independently. And it's pretty clear, right? In fact, the way you would generate this random variable is like, um, you know, first you flip a coin. If it came up heads, you'd be like, okay, both of them are heart. Otherwise, if it comes up tails, then if you like peer at the rest of this table here, you actually see that they're independent. Like once you've decided that they're not both hearts. Okay, and so like X, you know, you generate independently from Y, you flip a coin, and for Y, you flip two coins to tell if it's A, B, C, or D. Okay, so in other words, it's sort of like, it's the number of shared bits in your like computer program for generating X and Y together that you first spend uh, to reduce to the situation where the remaining calculations or the remaining generation is done independently. So uh, does this make sense? Okay, so we're gonna study this mutual information a little bit to get a bit more of a feel for it. Um, so let's see how big or small it can be. So this is also, as I mentioned, uh, non-negative. And I'll ask you again to fill in the blank here. When is the mutual information zero? You can kind of tell based on the name even, uh, what property must X and Y have for the mutual information to be zero? Independent, that's right, yeah. Uh, we saw before, if they're independent, then um, the, H, uh, the entropy of the joint random variable xy is the sum of the entropies, so the mutual information will be zero. Okay, so on, as for an upper bound, you could say to yourself, well, the mutual information is h of x plus h of y minus the entropy of x and y together, so the entropies are positive, so at most, an upper bound is uh, h of x plus h of y. Um, that's true, and I wonder if someone in the chat can tell me when this is uh, equality is achieved. This one requires a little more thought, so I'll take a nice sip of water. Uh, yes, one person said when X and Y are constants, that is correct. This is actually not a great upper bound. It's true, and sometimes it is achieved, but the only time it's achieved if like both X and Y are constant random variables and all the entropies are zero. It's a very trivial case. Uh, and I think you know, you'll understand this better when I just give the better upper bound, which is the better upper bound is an upper bound for the mutual information between X and Y is whatever is the minimum of the entropy of X and the entropy of Y. And the idea here is remember like, you know, this mutual information is supposed to represent like the savings that you can get from the fact that you're generating X and Y together as opposed to like independent copies of X and Y. And the most you can save is everything. So I mean, if you know, the entropy of X is three and the entropy of Y is 10, and now you're trying to generate them together, okay, you're gonna need at most 13 bits depending on whether or not, if you'll need 13 if they're independent. Um, but if they're not independent, like at the, in the, at the very least, you have to generate Y if you're gonna generate X and Y together. And generating Y takes entropy of Y, which in my little story example here was 10. So the most you could ever save is three, which is the entropy of X. And of course, let me uh, ask you again, you know, under what circumstance, oh, I should have reversed my example, but anyway, under what circumstance, let's say that uh, H of Y is the minimum, Y has less entropy than X, when is it the case that the mutual information between X and Y is equal to the whole entropy of Y? 
It's like asking, you know, when you're generating X and Y together, as opposed to independent copies, um, when is the amount of savings you can achieve entirely like sort of all the entropy of Y? Yes, somebody has said in the comments correctly when, uh, well, uh, somebody wrote, I think you wrote it a little bit backwards. Let me say X is the F of Y, but it, maybe it's the other way around. It's when uh, Y is a determined by X. Okay, so if Y is determined by X, then you're in a situation where you can like um, generate X, which costs you like uh, entropy of X bits. And then you don't need to spend any more bits to generate Y because it's determined by X. So you in total spent entropy of X uh, rather than spending entropy of X plus entropy of Y. So like the amount you saved with entropy of Y. Perhaps that'll be more clear with an example. So let's do an example. Let's say X is a random n bit string and Y is like the XOR of all the bits in X. So these are two non-independent, I mean, dependent random variables. X is an n bit string. Y is the XOR of the bits. So X is an N bit string, so it's uniformly distributed. The entropy is N. And Y itself, if you only squinted and saw Y and ignored the story on X, then Y just looks like a random bit. So it has one bit of entropy. But um, if you were to generate X and Y together, you can sort of see that the best thing you can do is just, or you know, the best thing you can do is generate X and then just compute deterministically the value of Y. So you, use, you spend n bits to do that. And so your savings over the sum of these two things, uh, you spend n out of a possible n plus one, so your savings is one, okay? And it kind of makes sense, I, I hope, to say that the mutual information between this x and y is one full bit. It's like the, the entropy in y. Uh, okay, so this was our example, and now uh, I want to look at like a slightly less trivial example where y is not completely just a function of x. Let me just set up a situation where, you know, x is not a function of y and y is not a function of x, but, they, you know, they're not independent. They have some dependence. And I'll just do it in a kind of like a simple way. Like, let me just say now y is two bits. It's a two-bit string, and the first bit of y is the xor of all the bits of x. And the second bit of y is just like another independent random bit. Um, okay, so just, just something uh, meaningful about this example, just some simple one I randomly cooked up. So uh, we can talk about like um, generating the pair x and y together, but let's, let's take the, I mean, communication point of view. So let's say like, um, you, it doesn't matter which analogy we talk about. Imagine you're going to like try to make a draw, for, you get a draw from X and Y, and you want to communicate the draw to someone using as few bits as possible. I mean, an idea is you could first communicate the common part. And I've drawn like a little Venn diagram here to try to illustrate this, like sort of the, the, the you know, spend enough bits for the, the, the joint amount of information between them, which is one bit in this case. And then having communicated the sort of the common part, you know, a number of bits that's equal to the mutual information, then you kind of communicate um, or spend in generation terms, like the deficit of H of X that you need to make up X. And you also communicate the deficit, oops, I should have drawn it like this, uh, the deficit from H of Y that you need to communicate Y. Okay, if you remember back to that example with the hearts, like there, the mutual information was one bit. You can imagine first communicating the single bit that tells you, are they both hard or not? And then you got reduced to the case where they're, if they're not, they're sort of independent of each other. And you had to like uh, generate the, you know, the rest for X and the rest for Y. So I say all this to motivate another definition. So there's this sort of the, almost the last definition or simple definition. Uh, the term we're defining here is, the conditional entropy of y given x. And it's sort of like intuitively the green shaded part of this Venn diagram region or this piece here. Sort of the information component of y that excludes the mutual information. Um, so as a formula and as a formal definition, it's again, a number. It's the entropy of y, but minus the mutual information between x and y. 
And uh, as we saw from last time, mutual information, it's always at most the minimum of h of x and h of y. So in particular, it's at most h of y, which implies that this quantity is non-negative. There's also the symmetrical definition, uh, the conditional entropy of y, uh, x given y. Uh, but let me just focus on this one. Um, Right, so these Venn diagrams are, you know, information theory are helpful. They can, uh, when you have more than two random variables, they can be harmful, but when they have two random variables, they're generally helpful. Uh, right, so here's this definition again, the conditional entropy of Y given X. And, um, we can just expand out this formula, I mean, just to get another formula, the mutual information of x and y is this, the sum of the entropies minus the joint entropy. So we plug that in, we get a different formula for the conditional um, entropy of y given x. It's the entropy of the joint random variable xy minus the entropy of x. Or like in the Venn diagram terms, right, it's sort of like the uh, total amount of information content in this blob, that's like h of x, y. And then you take away h of x, this circle, okay, and you get the green shaded region. Uh, and if you rearrange this inequality with uh, this, you get like a, an expression which is called the chain rule in information theory, which is that the entropy of a pair of random variables x and y, it's like the entropy of x, plus the entropy of y conditioned on x. Okay, so you'll see that get used uh, quite a lot in information theory. Uh, and I just wanted to write like yet another, I mean, I'm just writing all possible rearrangements of this formula. So like another rearrangement of this formula is this. And it's giving like a sort of a, an inwards description of the mutual information. Uh, so the mutual information between X and Y is also the entropy of Y minus the entropy of Y conditioned on X. All right, so let's like sort of taking like this circle here, which is the entropy of Y and subtracting out the green part and getting the overlap part. And you can kind of read this H of Y, entropy of Y minus entropy of Y given X. You can kind of, read it in like English language terms. These are all like, you know, intuitive crutches to help you reason about um, quantities that you'll eventually reason about by arithmetic and formulas with logs and things. Um, you can read it as like the amount of information gained about y um, knowing x. So, you know, it's like if a person like knows the outcome of x, Let's say, you know, somebody draws X and Y and then Alice like comes to know the outcome for X. How much does she learn about the outcome for Y? What's interesting about this is like this formula is asymmetric. I mean, it, X and Y play a different role, even though we know the mutual information is a totally symmetric uh, concept. Remember, it's uh, entropy of X plus entropy of Y minus the joint entropy. Um, so it means, you know, we can exchange X and Y, the left-hand side doesn't change, but the right-hand side does change. Uh, and so this is another formula for the mutual information. And it sort of says, in, you know, according to these definitions, the amount of info gained about X knowing Y is the same as the amount of info about Y knowing X. So that's maybe not the most, I mean, depending on how you look at it, that might or might not seem intuitive, but uh, it is true under this way of looking at things. Okay, so I just put these formulas up here and the, the, the Venn diagram again. And I want to say actually this entropy of Y given X is, in my opinion, kind of bad notation. Or maybe it is good notation, but it's like misleading at, at first. Because um, it looks like it's somehow the entropy of a random variable y conditioned on x, but it's actually an expectation. And uh, I'm going to leave this to you as an exercise. Again, it's just like writing down the formulas. But this conditional entropy of y given x, it's really an expectation of something. It's an expectation over, you draw like an outcome little x for x, and then having gotten an outcome little x for x, like heart or zero or one, you consider the random variable, which is y, but conditioned on 
capital X, the random variable, taking this value little x. So like if little x is heart, you know, you think of like, oh, now let's imagine the random variable y conditioned on x being heart, which is actually a simple random variable. It's just constantly heart. I don't know if you remember back my example with the hearts and uh, zeros and ones and A, B, C, D. Um, so in that case, the entropy of that random variable is zero, but some other time, you know, x might be one, little x might be one, and then the random variable y conditioned on little x might just be uniform on A, B, C, D, and that has entropy two. Um, so even though like this expression starts with an H, it's really like an expectation over the X outcomes of the entropy of a conditioned random variable. Okay, so we won't exactly need this later, but it's just something to watch out for. Okay. So, uh, the last thing I want to tell you is this is really like sort of a last definition of pure basic information theory things. Um, and we're not going to really work with it, but I need to make it here so we can talk easily about another concept. It's just the conditional mutual information of X and Y given Z. So uh, now you have three random variables involved. It has like sort of the natural definition. So it's like, what is the mutual information? So you imagine X, Y, and Z are all intertangled, like they may all depend on one another. And you sort of imagine like, what is the, on average, like once you draw and learn or condition on a value for Z, now what is the mutual information between X and Y? So I'll do an example in a moment. But at the level of formulas, it's like, it's the same definition as the mutual information between X and Y, except you stick a condition on Z everywhere. So now that we know how to define the conditional entropy, we can, you know, plug it into the definition for mutual information and get conditional mutual information. And again, just like with the conditional entropy, this is really an expectation. It's again, like you draw an outcome little z for capital Z, and then you consider like, okay, how does that change the random variables X and Y? X and Y may still be dependent, but their distributions might sort of change now that you've conditioned on capital Z being little z. You measure the mutual information of those random variables, and then you like take the expectation or the average over the, the draw from Z. So let me do an example that hopefully will clarify. And again, I'm going to ask you to fill in these blanks here. So this is the definition of conditional mutual information. And let me give an example here where we have three random variables. And uh, it's a classic scenario in probability. X and Y are independent random bits, and Z is their parity, or their XOR, or their sum mod 2. This is a classical example of like um, three random variables, random bits in fact, where um, they're not collectively independent, but any pair of them is independent. Okay? These are pairwise independent uh, bits. So, right, so what is the mutual information between X and Y? Does anybody want to? say in the chat. Zero. Very good. That's right. So if you just ignore Z in your life, just you can draw X and Y and Z all together, but just throw Z in the garbage, then X and Y are just independent random bits. And we know if you have two random variables, the mutual information is zero. Uh, there's no savings that you can get. So yeah, zero. But on the other hand, what is the mutual information between X and Y conditioned on Z? Someone can say one. Very good. That's right. Because basically, um, in fact, no matter the outcome of Z, if Z is either zero or one, once you condition on that, uh, X and Y go from being independent to being um, highly dependent, right? So I mean, if you condition on, let's say, uh, this XOR being zero, um, then that's exactly telling you that X plus Y mod two is zero, so X equals Y. So now X equals Y, and the mutual information between two equal random variables that are just a random bit is, is one. And conversely, if z happens to be one, then you totally know that x and y are opposite random bits. And again, the mutual information between um, two definitely opposite uniformly random bits is one. Okay, so uh, that's, that's true. That's a fact. And um, uh, it might be considered counterintuitive, but that's life, that like conditioning on a random variable can make the mutual information go up but it's sort of true. And this also implies that there's like no, I mentioned before that once you have three random variables, these like Venn diagrams of information like can't really make sense. Because, you know, imagine the only thing you knew about in life were X and Y. 
and they're independent random bits, so they have zero mutual information. So you'd be like, all right, well, I'll draw that Venn diagram. Here's X, and they have no mutual information, so they're non-overlapping Venn diagrams. There's Y. Um, on the other hand, if you think about just, let's say, X and Z in isolation and forget about Y, then X and Z are also independent random bits. So you'd be like, oh, the X and Z have no mutual information, so I better draw like an empty Venn diagram between X and Z. And similarly, an empty Venn diagram between Y and Z. Um, right, but there is, uh, I mean, this would sort of, the picture somehow suggests that they're all like independent and there's like no mutual information at all, but, you know, condition on Z there is mutual information between X and Y. So there's no way to like capture it with a Venn diagram. Um, so that's life. I mean, yeah, the Venn diagrams are just an intuitive aid when you have two random variables. Um, okay, great. So if you have any questions, do uh, chat them. Somebody says, this is a one-time pad. How is it a one-time pad? <laughs> It's kind of like if you're saying if like your message X is like one bit and you're like, oh, I'm gonna encrypt this message by XORing it with like a random one time pad Y. Maybe so. And then so Z looks totally random and it's independent of X, but like yeah, if you know Y, yeah, I guess I see what you're saying. Like it'd be more like a yeah, it'd be more like a one time pad if we like just had a Z here. If we wrote Z here, it's all the same. And we condition on Y here. And then it'd be like saying, like, oh yeah, like. You know, there's no mutual information between the message X and like the encoding Z when Y is a random one-time pad. But yeah, like the mutual information between X and Z is perfect if you condition on like knowing the one-time pad Y. Uh, does conditioning only increase mutual information? No, it can increase it or decrease it. Um, so uh, yeah, it can go either way. Is there a quick example I can think of for it um, uh, decreasing mutual information? Uh, yeah, well, like imagine, I don't know if you, I, <laughs> since I've worked with these slides before, I like remember that hard example very well, but if in that case with X and Y, where X and Y, you know, they're either both hard with probably a half or else they were like, independent, like X is a random bit, and like Y was a random letter between A and D. Let's see. The mutual information between X and Y there was one. Um, uh, but if you let Z be the, um, the, let's say, indicator random variable that X and Y are both heart, then condition on Z, whether, you know, they are both heart or are not both heart, they become independent. Uh, independent or constant. So I mean, that would mean their conditional mutual information is zero, even though their original mutual information was one. I think I got that example right. If I made a mistake, let me know. <laughs> 